Hi there, Amel. Let's take a look at this new set of essays um, about um, online communication. Do the advantages outweigh the disadvantages? Let's see what you wrote. Since the advent of technology over the last two decades, virtual communication in many workplaces has been more ubiquitous than physical meetings. S. Although this development has some drawbacks to people, the benefit it has for our lives is increasingly significant. This essay will discuss both sides using examples from Harvard and Toronto universities. Okay, I like this sentence really quite a bit. Um, so my understanding is reading the sentence that you think the benefits outweigh the disadvantages. It's not 100% clear because you say that it has some drawbacks, but... Uh, the benefits are increasingly significant. So it sounds like you're more in favor of the benefits when you phrase it like that. So you talk about the weakness first, and then you talk about the benefit. That's kind of what it sounds like. So let's see. On the one hand, there is ample evidence that the upsides of virtual communication in workplaces cannot be overstated. The second reason behind this is twofold. Firstly, if employees are connected digitally instead of commuting by transportation every day, they would save plenty of time and efforts. No, effort, singular. By this action, they can relocate Kate, this no, you want the word reallocate, which is a different word. They can reallocate this time to finish their personal tasks. Um, okay, thus making work more efficient. So just add that to explain why this is a benefit. Secondly, as some jobs necessitate regular office meetings, S, replacing them with online meetings, S, will decrease the total cost of these all right instead of meeting because you have meeting 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 so get rid of it use some cohesion so here uh will decrease the total cost of these for both the employers and their staff now staff is singular for example an extensive study by uh the school of business capital b harvard university shows and that companies which use digital communication for their meetings with an S have, this is careful, have over 20% less total cost. Careful with this. Um, hmm. Have, what are you trying to say? Well, maybe you could rephrase this because this expression, over 20% less total cost, it just sounds a little awkward. So let's see if we can rephrase it with something else. Why don't we do something like this? Uh, thus, me, no, wait. Have more than 20% uh, reduced costs or have, um, maybe it's the over and then less, which just sounds a little weird. So maybe, which have approximately 20% lower costs than other institutions which use face-to-face -face meetings. Just simplify your life and don't write it like this, okay? Thus, it is possible to stay beyond doubt that remote communication in workplaces has substantial upsides in terms of time and cost savings. Okay, cost saving, savings, I think is better here. All right, I thought that was pretty good. Um, you could see that there was just one place where I wanted you to develop it a little further. Oh, whole, I think it was nice. I thought that the vocabulary was very good. You had words like necessitate. Um, if you had done this correctly, reallocate would have been a great word. Um, some awkwardness here, but on the whole, it felt like it was a nice. It was a nicely developed paragraph. Let's move on a little bit. On the other hand, similar to any new advancement, virtual communication has some broad drawbacks if not used properly. This is largely because the technology. Need, this technology needs high quality internet and electricity. If they were not continuous or clear, they would create challenges to the user, such as misinterpreting, no, misinterpretation of data or misunderstanding some information. Furthermore, there is a possibility of hacking some private information if the online system is not fully secured. For instance, according to recent empirical research by the University of Toronto, comma, Get rid of demonstrated because you've got this according to. So you can't have according to and then demonstrated. So you have to decide, do you want according to or do you want demonstrated? If you want demonstrated, then it has to be. Recent empirical research by University of Toronto demonstrated. But if you're going to use according to, then you can't have demonstrated. And then it would sound like this. According to recent empirical research by University of Toronto, comma, about 10% of cases of breaking private information of some global companies were due to weak security systems in those companies. Therefore, online communication has some disadvantages such as necessity of 
continuous internet and electricity and possibility of invasion of privacy, which are dependent on their users. All right, I really want to fix this last sentence a little bit because I read it several times and it felt awkward to me. Let's make it like this. Therefore, online communication has some disadvantages, such as requiring continuous internet and electricity and the possibility of um, invasion of privacy, uh, comma, both of which are dependent on their users. To sum up, although digital meetings, S, have some downsides uh, for their users, the benefits they have to our lives are superior to their drawbacks. It is predicted that online communication will become more common and might replace face-to-face -face meetings with an S in the foreseeable future. Okay, um, this is fine. Um, so I generally like this essay, actually. There's one thing I want to change. Um, you talked about the positives first. You talked about the negatives second. I think it would have made more sense if you had talked about the negatives first and the positives second. In other words, one thing that a lot of IELTS tutors will recommend is um, using this kind of order. In other words, start with the paragraph that you don't support and then um, leave the paragraph that you do support to be closer to the end of the essay, closer to your conclusion, okay? And I think that would have been more fitting here, especially since it actually mirrors what you were saying right here in your thesis statement, okay? So that's my one suggestion. Other than that, I thought it was good. Obviously, there were some little things throughout the essay that I want you to work on, um, little things with grammar, um, which are not really, really serious, but when you look at them in their entirety and how consistently some of these errors um, occur, uh, they are the kind of thing, uh, because of their frequency, that may contribute to uh, giving you a lower grammar score. So we really want you to be careful about those. All right, let's take a look now at your task one, school subjects in Germany, great. Okay, um, I know it's over. No, it's not. This is 118 words. So um, it's definitely under length. Um, an examiner, and nowadays basically examiners are not looking at the word count, so you're not um, penalized for being under 150 words. But um, something like this shows that it has not been developed well. And so Either way, you'll probably be marked down for task achievement because there there um, was more opportunity for develop which for development which you didn't take. So let's take a look. I'm going to just shrink it slightly. Okay, there we go. Perfect. The pie chart shows a percentage of nine subjects chosen by students studying in schools in Germany in 2017. The most popular subject among the nine subjects is PE, followed by history which has approximately similar figures at 22.9 and 22.4% respectively. In contrast, IT is the least popular subject at 3.7%. Okay. Regarding biology and geography, the difference in their percentages was insignificant, is insignificant, 0.5%. Likewise, the popularity of physics and maths are broadly similar, which are about double the figure of biology and fig physics, uh, they show percent, no, showing percentages of 18.1 and 19.5 respectively. Overall, it is clear that PE is the most popular subject of the nine school subjects, whereas IT is undoubtedly the least in popularity. Okay, so for me, the major problem is um, these two paragraphs. You had a lot of opportunities to develop this and to really stretch it out. And quite frankly, you don't have a choice. You have to stretch it out um, in order to have a well-developed answer here. Um, what you did instead is you linked a lot of things together. When you have such little information as you do here, you don't want to link things together. You don't want to group things. Um, quite the opposite. You really want to highlight the differences uh, show comparisons, really stretch this out, okay? And I particularly, I personally find these to be a little more challenging than the ones where there is a ton of information to write about because it's like, okay, well, how do you stretch this out? Well, let me see if I can come up with some suggestions for you. Okay, 
Um, the most popular su uh, su school subject among the nine subjects is PE at 22.9%. Um, it is merely 0.5% higher than the next most popular subject, which was history. Okay, so you can see I'm really stretching this out quite a bit. Um, in contrast, IT was the least popular subject at 3.7%, roughly uh, one-seventh the percentage of history or uh, one seventh the figure for PE. That's actually what I meant to say. One seventh the percentage of PE. Now, why am I saying that? Because three is uh, roughly uh, one seventh of, well, 21 really. But I mean, you're saying roughly, so you don't have to be exact. Okay, but that's the kind of thing that you want to show here. So, what's the difference between the most popular and the most and the least popular? All right, and that's one way to do it. And then here, you started off by telling us a difference in biology and geography, but you never actually told us what their figures were. So this was kind of awkward. Um, I think that what you did would have been better down here. Let me show you what I mean. Regarding, um, yeah, I actually didn't like that you talked about biology and geography here. I think it would have made more sense to talk about um, physics and math. So. The second, the third most popular subject, let me try that again. The third most popular subject was uh, maths. Um, let's see, uh, with three, uh, at 3% lower than history, okay, and then you can write in parentheses 19.5. It was followed uh, by physics at 18.1%. And then you can make like a general statement about the four of them. So, um, together, the four most popular subjects um, accounted for, I don't know, what is it, about 85%? It's around there, I think. So, um, in total, the four most popular subjects accounted for about 85% of the subject popularity. So, then you're really kind of summarizing these figures here, okay? And... Um, then, let's see, from there, then it makes sense to start a new paragraph talking about biology, geography, and IT. So you could say something like, the three least most popular subjects all had less than 10% popularity. And I really kind of like this. It's kind of like creating an umbrella, and you put everything under that. So it's, you know what I mean? So you've got this point here where you're saying that everything is below that point. Um, and it's a nice kind of introductory sentence for that paragraph. So the three least popular subjects um, all had less than 10% uh, popularity. More specifically, biology recorded 7.1%. It was uh, one, no it wasn't, it was, uh, 0.7% higher than the next pop most popular subject, ge geography, at 6.4%. So you get my point, okay? And then, of course, it's really nice to make a, uh, a comparison between IT and bio biology because this is half of this. So, you know, you can include that as well. But this is how I think you really need to be doing something like this, okay? Um... That's pretty much it. Okay, so go ahead and correct these. Let me know if you have any questions about my suggestions um, and about the feedback in today's set. And let's see more work from me, okay? Good luck.